This is the day that God has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning and welcome to Zion United Church of Christ here in Union, Missouri. As the seasons start to change, right, next weekend is Labor Day weekend, all of a sudden the unofficial end of summer, also kind of the beginning of the school year, and what I'm reminded of as somebody who spent most of my life in school up until this point, even though it's been a while, we remember those first moments, those first days, whether it's school, whether it's a new job, whether it's a new place, whether it's showing up for the first time in a new community, there's that nervousness that sets in. Whether you put on a brave face or not, whether you know a couple people before you begin, there's still that worry. There's still that little bit of anxiety that creeps in and that takes hold of you. And so as we begin worship service, I think there's just this nice moment and exercise that we can do, is that we think about that former self, that younger self, whether you were six years old getting ready to go to kindergarten or this was six months ago when you tried to do a, a new program and join a new community for the first time. If you could just have a moment to talk to that younger self and to tell them that it was going to be okay, that you were going to survive, that you could be loving and gracious to that version of you. It's this little this time of worship as we prepare our hearts and minds to experience the fullness and graciousness and love of God, as we prepare our hearts to love ourselves and one another as God loves us. Take this time to sit and ponder and talk to that younger self, that inner child of yours, and be gracious and loving to them, letting them know it's going to be all right, and that you'll make it, and that it was worth doing in the first place. It is time to worship God.
Good morning. Please join in our call to worship. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Happy are those whose help is in the Lord their God. Our hope is the one who gives justice to the oppressed, food to the hungry, sets the prisoners free, lifts up all the who are bound down. The Lord loves the righteous, protects the stranger, and helps the widow and orphan. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. Let us worship God. And for our gathering prayer, let us pray. Hospitable, Hospitable God, God, you invite, invite us, us to a banquet, banquet where the last, last may be first, and the, the humble and the, and the mighty trade places. places. Let us, Let us share, share your abundance, abundance with, no with no fear of scarcity. Let us, Let us greet strangers as angels you have sent. Send, send your spirit now, now so, that so that we may find a place at your table and welcome others with radical hospitality. In the, In the name, name of Jesus, guests at all our tables, table, we, pray. we pray. Amen. Our first reading of scripture is from Psalm 112 from the Common English Bible. Praise the Lord. Those who honor the Lord, who adore God's commandments, are truly happy. Their descendants will be strong throughout the land. The offspring of those who do right will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in their houses. Their righteousness stands forever. They shine in the dark for others who do right. They are merciful, compassionate, and righteous. Those who lend generously are good people, as are those who conduct their affairs with justice. Yes, these sorts of people will never be shaken. The righteous will be remembered forever. They won't be frightened at bad news. Their hearts are steady, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are firm. They aren't afraid. In the end, they will witness their enemy's defeat. They give freely to those in need. Their righteousness stands forever. Their strength increases gloriously. The wicked see all this and fume. They grind their teeth but disappear to nothing. What the wicked want to see happen comes to nothing. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Please rise in body or in spirit for our opening hymn number 48.
Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. For God gives sleep to God's beloved. So often we want the world to change, but we refuse to change ourselves. When we confess our sin, we join in the transformation of the world. Would you please join me in our prayer of confession? Almighty God, our gracious host, you have invited us to join in your realm. You call us to leave behind our selfish ways and follow in your ways of justice, righteousness, and peace. Yet we balk at your offer. We have sinned in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. Forgive us, we pray, and grant us the courage to be who you have called us to be. Amen. God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. God will not always accuse nor remember our sin forever. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. So we continue on with our service. I just have a few announcements for the good of our community. Uh, the first, there's just two points that I want to point out that are in our bulletin insert. Um, that are kind of new and that we're getting excited for. Uh, the first is the MoVal retreat coming up. So over the past few months, uh, myself, Alicia, um, Laura, the pastor at St. Jordan's down in St. Clair, and Eric Moeller, uh, the associate pastor at St. Peter's in Washington, have been coming together to put on a retreat for our three congregations. Um, one, we want to be able to have a retreat just at MoVal and do all of the fun camp things um, for a multi-generational event. Um, but secondly, we want to see um, and share our experiences and see what's going on between our three congregations. Uh, we know that we're only so, we're so close to one another, uh, just physically, um, and we're wanting to see what kind of crossover we might be doing, what ways and new ways might emerge between our congregations. Um, so there is information in our bulletin. There will be registration forms coming out in the newsletter. We'll also have access to that online. Um, that'll be towards the end of September. And the second is that Logos is starting back up. So next week is our rally weekend, or no, two weeks from today is our rally weekend. And so what you'll, you'll see is that for Logos, September 7th and 14th from 5 to 7.30 p.m., um, we'll be having our Logos events back. So it'll be the first two Wednesdays of every month um, starting in September. Um, and so we need volunteers, we need folks to sit at the table with the kids and be kind of those table stewards, um, so the table parents. And we'll also need people to help out with the meal, whether it's with cooking or cleanup. Um, so if you're interested in either coming back, um, I know it's been a couple of years since we've been having the meals at Logos, um, or if you're interested for the first time, just let Alicia know or Mandy, um, and we'll plug you in to that wonderful program starting back up. And with that, friends, brothers, sisters, siblings in Christ, it is time to give thanks to God for our tithes and offerings that we continue to be grateful for, that we continue to offer to God in thanksgiving um, for the blessing of our ministry here in this place. Would you please rise in body or in spirit and join me in our doxology. prayer of dedication. Dear God, you have offered us a place at the table 
and you have called us to share without expectation of being repaid. You have called us to make a place for the poor, the outcast, and the oppressed. So we ask that you bless these resources so that they might support ministries of compassion and justice until all of your children have a place at the table. Amen. Please be seated. The second reading of Scripture comes from the Gospel according to Luke chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to share a meal in the home of one of the leaders of the Pharisees, they were watching him closely. A man suffering from an abnormal swelling of the body was there. Jesus asked the lawyers and Pharisees, does the law allow healing on the Sabbath or not? But they said nothing. Jesus took hold of the sick man, cured him, and then let him go. He said to them, suppose your child or ox fell into a ditch on the Sabbath day. Wouldn't you immediately pull it out? But they had no response. When Jesus noticed how the guests sought out the best seats at the table, he told them a parable. When someone invites you to a wedding celebration, don't take your seat in the place of honor. Someone more highly regarded than you could have been invited by your host. The host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give your seat to this other person. Embarrassed, you will take your seat in the least important place. Instead, when you receive an invitation, go and sit in the least important place. When your host approaches you, he will say, friend, move up here to a better seat. Then you will be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. All who lift themselves up will be brought low, and those who make themselves low will be lifted up. Then Jesus said to the person who had invited him, When you host a lunch or dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers and sisters, your relatives or rich neighbors. If you do, they will invite you in return, and that will be your reward. Instead, when you give a banquet, invite the poor, crippled, lame, and blind, and you will be blessed because they can't repay you. Instead, you will be repaid when the just are resurrected. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God.
Please join me in the spirit of prayer. O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Norman Wiersbe says, and I quote, you can never bite into only one thing. Food is a holy and humbling mystery we participate in daily. To share a meal is a sacred thing. Imagine for the moment the last time you truly shared a meal. Now, it doesn't matter if it was just last night or weeks ago, whether it was just your ordinary, typical dinner, or whether it was some gathering where you had a celebration with friends and family. What did you eat? Who prepared the meal? Who created the recipe? Who grew the food? What was the soil like where that food was raised? What nourished that soil? How did the food get to you? Who processed it? Who inspected it? Who drove the truck? In every bite, there are endless questions we can ask. The agricultural and culinary histories of every bite transcend our full comprehension and bind us in ways that pass understanding. When you pay attention, you can feel the love, smell the gratitude, and taste the grace of a meal in every bite. The Gospel of Luke has more references to food, meals, and eating than any other gospel. It is at the table where Jesus shares food with his closest companions and strangers he will never see again. It is at a table where Jesus often shares his teachings and parables. At the table, he practices radical hospitality and is received as a gracious guest. It is so common in the Gospel of Luke for Jesus to be at table with all kinds of people that a few chapters earlier, back in chapter 7, Jesus, that Jesus says, and according to Jesus, that there are rumors going around about him, about how he is a glutton and a drunkard who eats with tax collectors and sinners. Jesus' constant eating and table fellowship are reminders that our faith is embodied, that our faith is lived out in the daily practices that we share. So today, we are invited to pull up a seat and savor what our Savior has to share. Today's story begins at the home of a Pharisee who has invited Jesus along with many others to share in a meal. At the end of chapter 13, just before today's reading, a group of Pharisees is concerned about Jesus' safety and warns him that Herod is plotting to kill him. So we have to remember once again, we need not approach today's text with suspicion over the Pharisees and their motives. But within this story, there are four major moments during this dinner party. The first is the healing on the Sabbath. Similar to last week that we talked about, Jesus' healing presents us with a reminder to do what we can for those who need our help the moment we can do something about it. The second lesson is for guests to be humble. Jesus instructs people not to take the position of honor at the seat at the table, assuming that they are the most important guest, and instead offering true humility. Here Jesus is asking to, for people to arrive as gracious guests rather than trying to figure out some cunning strategy to secretly jockey for position. I don't think Jesus is saying, oh, if you sit in the last, then you'll magically make your way up to the front, so you should really, if you want to get ahead, you know, go to the back. I think Jesus is asking for true humility here. And the third movement or moment in the story is similar to the second, where Jesus gives a lesson for the host. Jesus tells the host to invite people who cannot repay them. Once again, it is an invitation to participate in grace by doing good for no other reason than that it is good. In the fourth moment or movement in the story, which we didn't read today, but if we were to have kept on reading the story, we would have heard Jesus tell a parable about a wealthy man who sends out invitations to some guests. But when all of the guests decline, they start making excuses why they can't show up for this dinner. So the wealthy man sends out his servants to the highways and back alleys and invites the poor, the lame, the crippled into his home. 
true humility and doing things for those who cannot repay you shape the story of Jesus at today's feast. In Jesus' time, the client patronage system of ancient Rome was starting to dominate the region. Within the Roman structure, it created clear lines of hierarchy. The social rankings of the patronage system determined who had greater access to prestige, power, and wealth, who had greater access to laws and changing them. While there was some reciprocity and obligation towards one another, it was awfully, it was fairly, it was typically very one-sided, wherein the lower classes greatly benefit, benefited their patrons rather than their patrons greatly benefiting them. Since moving, between, moving from the lower class to the upper class was nearly impossible, the greatest advantage a lower class person can have was being connected to a more prestigious patron. And as Roman influence was spreading through the region, this system was being adopted by the elite and the ruling classes who wanted to maintain their power. Jewish leaders, sects, and communities had all different kinds of ways to adapting to these changing times. Some would adopt Roman rule and culture to preserve their power, like King Herod. Others would find different ways to subvert, combat, or ignore the cultural influence. Jesus, like many of his contemporaries, found ways to deal with this societal influence. Jesus chooses humility as one of the ways to counter Roman imperial rule. For Jesus, humility is not about denying your power or ability or prestige, but acknowledging that others have equal power, ability, and prestige, and not assuming that yours is more important than theirs. Resisting the system wasn't merely about rejecting Roman imperialism. It was about preserving his Jewish cultural heritage. Jesus is letting folks know that even when something might not directly benefit you, it doesn't mean it isn't worth doing. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, was offering an alternative world view from the Roman imperial system. Today's story is about table fellowship. It's not about manners and how to be polite. It's about humility and service. It's about how our embodied faith practices show up in the world. What is so remarkable about the setting of the story is how incredibly ordinary it is. It's a meal. It's taken place at a table with food and drink and story. By taking on flesh and blood and showing up in the world, our Savior, our Messiah, Jesus, our Emmanuel, reminds us Life isn't just about what happens after we die. It's about living into its fullness here and now. By healing, feeding, and teaching, Jesus invites all to participate. He welcomes all to this table of grace, love, and mercy. By including tax collectors and sinners, women, the disabled, and all those deemed unworthy by society's standards, along with all of those who are also deemed worthy, Jesus reminds us there is pla there's a place for all of us in the kingdom of God. Beginning this story with the healing, Jesus is letting us know that the first course of this meal is love. And while grace and love, humility and honor seem to take center stage in the story, fear dominates this text. Fear dominates our world as well. One of our biggest fears is that we don't measure up, that we don't count, or at the, last we don't, or at the least we don't count as much as the rest of the world or as the other people in the room. It doesn't matter if you are in middle school or middle age, we constantly worry about where we're supposed to sit. We have that anxiety that just kind of stays with us in every room we go into, wondering if we're worthy of being here. We all have these feelings about being ignored, overlooked, and undervalued. And so often, fear drives our decisions about how we interact in the world. And in our fear, it's often the case that we start demanding fairness. But Caroline Lewis, uh, a professor and a, a writer, says, she has a, a, a word on how we're supposed to really look at this fear in our world and this reciprocity. She says, and I quote, how do you measure or calculate repayment of love, of mercy? The fact that we think we can is a rather striking theological problem. 
we tend to forget that our beliefs about faith and discipleship are also claims about what we think God is, about who we think God is. If we insist that our faith, our salvation, is dependent upon an equal rate of exchange between God and us, then we need to ask ourselves, in what kind of God do we believe? And what happens if we don't measure up? And what makes us think we can assume certain systems to quantify the grace of God? This story calls out our propensity toward transactional faith. We expect God to move about in our economies that are dependent on proof, proof of worth and jobs well done. We assume God will choose to maintain a relationship with us based on our ministry performance. But then we forget a key theological premise of Luke. God's measure of membership in the kingdom has everything to do with how God sees us and not how we see ourselves. End quote. The kingdom of God has everything to do with how God sees us and not how we see ourselves and not how we see one another, but how God sees each of us for who we truly are, with all of our burdens, with all of our blessings. My home congregation has prepared a community meal every Wednesday since 2004. It started with a single meal after a single Ash Wednesday service. For some reason, the congregation decided they wanted to have a noon service, and if they were going to invite people to come during lunch, they thought, well, we should provide a meal for the dozen or so people who might show up. And when 50 people showed up that first Sunday, or that first Wednesday, they thought, hey, maybe we'll carry this out through all of Lent. And when more and more people started showing up week after week during Lent, they said, hey, maybe we can do this to the end of the year. And then when the end of the year came around, they said, hey, people have been coming. There's about 150, 200 people starting to show up week after week after week. Maybe we can just keep doing this. And so growing up, there were more people that came into my congregation, into the church on Wednesday afternoon than they did on Sunday morning. And with this practice, we were a downtown church, and so many of these guests that would join us during these meals were the homeless population, the marginally housed, kind of making it week to week. And so during the summers, my mother, my brother, and I would go to volunteer. And during this volunteering time, we would help where we could. Sometimes I would help make the meal. Sometimes, most of the time, I was just cleaning dishes in the back or just simply saying which desserts were which as people were coming through the line. But out of everything that the volunteers were asked to do, there was really only one rule that was maintained for all volunteers. You weren't allowed to eat in the kitchen. You had to go and take your meal and go out into the fellowship hall and sit down at a table and share a meal. And it's this one simple rule that made all the difference with this program or with my experience of what we called the largest table. Because it was in these little moments where you're nervous, right? Once again, you're going out to a bunch of strangers and asking, can I sit here? You know, I'm a middle schooler and a high schooler and recognizing the humanity, the full humanity in the folks who are coming by. And because it wasn't just the homeless folks who were making their way to these meals, but we were also a block away from the courthouse. So we would have you know, some bailiffs coming down, we'd have some lawyers, some clerks, occasionally a judge or two would make their way. And so we'd be sitting here and talking and having conversation and just what, you know, like you do when you turn strangers into friends. When you see others the way God sees them. It's a powerful experience to remember how these meals we share transcend our own little anxieties, our worries, our prejudices. They help us come together in so many unexpected ways. Food, meals, communities have always, had, have always connected us in profound ways. During the pandemic, our eating habits changed. At the start, there was a surge of home cooks, from sourdough starters to quick pickles, and soon grandma's old recipe box got dusted off. Then canning became so popular that nobody could find flats. 
And soon, with the rise of groceries on demand and work from home orders, people became, gave, were able to have more time and focus on cooking. And meanwhile, there's also a large group of our population that never worked from home that life carried on and their work carried on in the same way that it always had. And so divides began between who was deemed worthy, who was deemed necessary, who was deemed essential. All of a sudden, we were wondering once again where our place was in society. Fear started to creep in. We were wondering if we were missing out. We were wondering where our position was. And now, as the pandemic wades and food prices surge, we are once again at an impasse about how we gather at the table, both practically and metaphorically. Protocol for how we share food, how we show up at meals, and how we enjoy one another's company is changing. Hospitality has changed over the past few years, and yet the more things change, the more things stay the same. People still need food. People still need to be fed by more than just food. Keeping everyone safe and taken care of is just as important. Table fellowship helps us humanize one another in ways we can barely comprehend. Grace and humility are needed now just as much as ever. I was always told to never trust someone who is nice to you but rude to the waiter. Because if a person can be awful to the person serving them, they don't need to see them as an equal. They don't recognize the person's full humanity. They probably don't understand what it's like to be in that other person's shoes. This is why the greatest guests are good hosts and why the best hosts are always gracious guests. Wanting other people to suffer just because you did is an indicator that you probably have some healing work to do. Thinking everyone just needs to pay their dues probably fails to recognize the hurt that you still carry with them. Wanting others to suffer and struggle indicates that you probably have a hard time accepting grace and practicing humility. And so we are reminded about Jesus' table fellowship practices, about our call to humility, our call to join in the table, our call to show up whether we believe that we deserve a spot or not, whether we have come with all of our problems, all of our burdens, or we are gathering with all of our blessings ready to share. At the end of the day, we have to ask ourselves a question about who we think God is, who we think Christ is. Do we think that at the table of Christ, Jesus would rather kick someone out of their seat, or would he rather just pull up an extra chair? So I don't know where I'm going to go with this. I kind of don't know how I'm going to end, but I'm going to end with, with one little last point. I've always found that when we share meals, there's always so much going on other than the meals that we're sharing. There's a beauty about it, but there's also a beauty and simplicity of sharing a meal. It is in these very human tasks that I am reminded that the love of God shows up. Because again and again, as I mentioned earlier, Jesus shares in these meals. Jesus continues to eat with people. He continues to lounge, or relax, find ways to break bread. Once again, in the, particularly in the Gospel of Luke, it's mentioned again and again that he's spending time to have a meal. And so that it's at these meals when we show up, when we can bring our full selves forward, that we are reminded to be our best selves, to be who God calls us to be, to see one another as God sees, and to love one another as God loves. So I don't know how your eating habits have been over the past few years or over the past few days or weeks, but it is my hope that when the next time you sit down to share a meal, you will remember that you are loved, that you are cared for, that you are worthy of the seat in which you are sitting. So would you please join me in the spirit of prayer. Holy and gracious host, 
We give you thanks. We give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for our ability to come together, to share our joys and our concerns, to share our blessings and our burdens, to share this thing we call life together. Help us in our times of need. Help us to be as generous as you are generous. Help us to be as loving as you are loving. Help us to see all people through your eyes and not through our fears. O Holy One, help us to set an extra seat, to pull up an extra chair, and to remember that the meals we share, however simple they may be, are perhaps some of the most beautiful and intimate moments we can have as people. And so God, we are reminded of people and places all over this world, of dining room tables and kitchen tables around the world. We pray for the world, for all of those who live within it, for all of the creatures of this planet that call it home. Pray for the peoples of this world, for communities all over the world. We pray for our country, for those who serve it. We pray for our communities near and far. We pray for our neighbors, pray for the strangers who cross our paths, and we pray, O oh God, even for those we deem our enemies. We pray for our friends and our families, our loved ones, O oh Lord, that you may grant them the peace and love and care that they need. And finally, God, we pray for ourselves. We pray that you would help us to see us as you see us, and not the way we often see ourselves. And, O oh God, although we don't always know where we're going, we do know who we're following. And so we pray the prayer Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please rise in body or in spirit and join me in our closing hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds, hymn number 393.
as you go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and bring you peace, knowing that there is nothing you can do, nothing you can say, not heights, nor depths, nor things in the past, nor things to come, nor anything else in all of creation that will separate you from the love of God, which we have come to know in Jesus the Christ. Go in peace this day and always. Amen and amen. Thank you.